गाइज एंड वेलकम बैक टू माई चैनल सो टूडेज वीडियो इज गोइंग टू बी ऑन रेट नाउ आई ऑलरेडी मेड अ वीडियो ऑन द पैटर्न एज टू हाउ आई एम गोइंग टू अपलोड द ऑडियो बुक्स फ्रॉम नाउ ऑन इफ यू हैवेंट वॉच दैट वीडियो इट विद द लिंक जस्ट वॉच इट सो यू नो दैट हाउ यू नो थिंग्स आर गोइंग टू गो फर्दर now uh in this video i'll tell a little bit about rake like a minute or two i'll talk about like you know if you don't know what the book is about uh rake by lj shen and then i'll read out the blurb and then i'll read the first two chapters so that you know you get into the book you know like oh this is the story you know the setting and everything and then i will read out the uh epilogue or the last chapter whatever it is uh if you don't want to listen to it you can stop the video there uh also now obviously you will be curious what is in the between so for that what you need to do is i uh, there, there's my email id uh i'll try to find the link to my instagram i am really technically challenged that way so if i can i'll share my instagram id so you can you people can dm me that this is the book you need so that you know what happen is if you want the pdf or the epub version i can send you that or else uh, if you want the audio book then you tell me i'll put that audio book and i'll give you the link to that particular uh, video uh, so that you can listen to it you know just know all the details just watch the video in the description or in the i so that you know all the details about it okay so first of all i'll read the blurb of the book boston's most infamous femme fatale meets her match in the dangerously mild englishman who has vowed to never marry em emma bell pendrose has cruised through life never needing a man a plan that has worked stunningly well until about 5 minutes ago when she decided she must have a baby devon whitehall is 62 of premium dna financial security and british royal titles best of all he fears the one thing she dreads the most getting hitched emma bell figures it's no brainer when devon offers his service sperm and involvement in her future child's life what begins as an innocent modern family like arrangement quickly erodes into a web of lies dark pasts and unfurled secrets Inside this chaos, Emma Bell and Devon Devon are forced to face the awful truth: they are capable of love. Even worse, they might feel it towards each other. So this is uh, the blurb of the book. Now, uh, this a little. Let me tell you a little about the series. There are four books in the series, Boston Bell series. there are four best friends and each story is each book is you know a story on one of them this is the last uh, one in the series and this is actually is the most intriguing one because her character is like super strong and like she doesn't give a fuck about anything she does what she wants to do but apparently there is a lot of trauma in her life like she has been through a lot and most of the people in her life who are like very special they don't even know about it I have read this book. It's a fabulous one. Like, I mean, it's an L J Shen book, so it it cannot be bad. Also, guys, I've changed my specs. Can you tell me if this one is better or the earlier one was better? Because I don't know. I don't like myself much uh, like right now than I used to like in the earlier frame. So just let me know in the comment section. Okay, and uh, Rake, he is a British royalty. Uh, he has had really. Uh, not i would say difficult childhood but like you know his parents were never involved much and they tried to kill him once and there's a lot of uh, mystery suspense in this book so definitely you need to read this book so i'll read the first two chapters and let's like you know set the pace let's get in the story and um, i'll read the epilogue this book has an epilogue so i'll read the epilogue which is so cute i loved it uh i hope you guys will love this book too now uh, as i've already said the details and everything if you want it just let me know i'll provide the book or whatever it is so let's start without wasting any more time in the beginning um this story contains subject matters some may find triggering including child abuse and grooming this book is not meant to make you feel comfortable and fuzzy inside please take this into consideration before start re- start reading 
so a warning to all of you but i i mean once you read like a type of writer you just know what kind of stuff they write like you get a gist of it so you probably if you read lg shen books earlier you don't need to worry about it but otherwise just look into it let's start the prologue devin i had been betrothed shortly before i was conceived my future written sealed and agreed upon before my mother had her first ultrasound appointment before i had a heart a pulse lung and a spine ideas wishes and preferences when i was no more than an abstract idea a future plan a box to be ticked off her name was louisa butchart lou for those who knew her though i would not be aware of this arrangement until i turned 14 told right before the traditional pre christmas hunting trip the white halls had with the butchers there was nothing wrong with luisa but butchert nothing that i could find at any rate she was lovely well mannered of excellent pedigree nothing wrong with her at all except for one thing she was in my choice i suppose this was how it all started how i became who i am today a fun loving whiskey drinking pensing skiing hedonist who answered to no one and tumbled into bed with everyone all the numbers and variables were there to create the perfect equation great expectation multiplied by crushing demands morally divided by more money than i could ever burn i've been blessed with the right physique right bank account right smirk and right amount of charm with only one invisible thing missing a soul the thing about not having a soul was that i wasn't even aware of it it took someone special to show me that i have been missing that it had been missing someone like emma bell Perse- penrose she cut me open and tar spilled out sticky dark and never ending this is the true royal rake secret my blood never ran blue it was like my heart pure black 14 years old we rode at sunset the hounds led the way my father and the, his comrade byron butchert senior followed closely their horses cantered in perfect rhythm byron junior benedict and i trailed behind they gave the young lads the mars they were unruly and harder to break taming young spirited females was an ex- exercise men of class had been given from a young age after all we were born into a life that required a well trained wife pudgy pudgy babies con- crockets and alluring mistresses chin and heel down back ramrod straight i was the picture of a royal equestrian not that it helped me avoid being thrown into the sweet box curling into myself like a snail papa loved throwing me in there for the sake of watching me squirm no matter how hard how diligently how desperately i tried to please him the sweat box also known as the isolation bin was a 17th century dumb waiter it had a coffin like shape and off uh, and offered the same experience since i was notoriously claustrophobic this was my father's go to punishment whenever i misbehaved misbehaving however wasn't something i did often or even at all that was the sad part i wanted badly to be accepted i was a straight a student and a gifted fencer i had even made it to the england youth champion in sambre but was still thrown into the dumb waiter when i lost to george stanfield perhaps my father always knew what i tried to keep concealed from view on the outside i was perfect on the inside however i was rotten to the bone at 14 i had already slept with two of the servants daughters managed to ride my father's favorite horse to its untimely death and flirted with cocaine and specially k not the cereal now we were going fox hunting i quite hated fox hunting and by quite i mean a bloody lot i detested it as a sport and a concept and a hobby 
I drew no pleasure from, from killing helpless animals. Father said blood sport was a great English tradition. More like cheese rolling and Morris dancing. Personally, I thought some traditions did not in fact age as well as others. Burning heretics at the stake was one example, fox hunting another. Noteworthy to distinguish fox hunting was or shall I say is illegal in the United Kingdom. But men of power, I've come to learn, have a complex and oftentimes temptous relation with the law. They enforced and determined it, yet dis disregarded it almost completely. My father and Byron Sr. enjoyed fox hunting all the more because it was forbidden to the, fo to the lower classes. It gave the sport an added shine, an eternal reminder that they were born different, better. We were heading into the woods, passing by a cobbled path to the grand iron wrought gate of Whitehall Court Castle, my father's estate in Kent. My stomach churned as I thought about what I was about to do, kill innocent animals to mollify my father. The soft tapping of Mary Jane's clunked behind us, hitting the pebbles. Davy, wait! The voice was breathless needy. I leaned back on Duchess, pushing my feet forward, pulling at the reins. The mare gated back. Louisa appeared at my side, clutching something wrapped haphazardly. She was in her pink pajamas. Her teeth were covered in colourful, horrendous braces. I've got you something. She slapped away a piece of brown hair sticking to her forehead. Louisa was two years my junior. I was at the unfortunate stage of adolescence where I found anything including sharp objects and a certain fruit sexually appealing. But Louisa was still a child, loose, jointed and pocket-sized. Her eyes were big and inquisitive, drinking in the world in gulps. She was not exactly a looker with her average features in boyish frame. And her braces gave her a speech impediment and she was self-conscious about it. Lo, I drawled quirking my eyebrow. Your mum's going to have a fit if she finds you snuck out. Don't care. She rose on her toes, handing me something wrapped in one of her sensible cardigan sweater. I tossed her jumper, delighted to find my father's engraved flask inside heavy with bourbon. I know you dislike fox hunting, so I bought you something to... How does Dot Dear Daddy say it? Take the edge off. The others moved along, entering the thick mossy woods, bracketing Whitehall Court Castle, either unaware or disinterested in my absence. You little nutter. I took a swig of the flask, feeling the sharp burn of liquid rolling down my throat. How did you get your hands on this? Lo beamed with pride, cupping her mouth to cover all the metals. I snuck into your papa's study. No one ever noticed me, so I can get away with loads of stuff. The despondence in her eyes made, made me sad for her. Lo dreamed of being, of going to Australia and becoming wildlife rescuer, surrounding, surrounded by kangaroos and koalas. I hope for her sake that she would. Wild animals, no matter how aggressive, were still superior to humans. I notice you. Do you really? Her eyes grew bigger, browner. Cross my heart. I scratched behind the Dutch's ear. Females, I've come to realize, were ridiculously easy to please. You'll never get rid of me. I don't want to get rid of you. She said hotly, I'll do anything for you. Oh, anything now? I chuckled. Lo and I had a relationship of an older brother and younger sister. She did things to try and win my affection and I in return assured her she was nice and caring. She nodded eagerly. I'll always have your back. Right then, I was ready to move along. Do you think you'll ever tell your parents you're vegetarian? She blurted out. How did she know this? I noticed you shy away from meat and even fish when we dine. She buried one of her Mary Janes in the pebbles, digging her toes in, looking down in embarrassment. No, 
I shook my head, my tone cold. There are some things my parents don't need to know. And then, because we, because we had nothing more to say, and maybe because I was afraid Papa would throw me in the dumb waiter if he saw me loitering behind, I said, well, cheers for the drinks. I raised the flask in salute, squeezed Dutch's belly with my riding boot and joined the others. Oh, look, if it isn't posh spice. Benedict Lowe's middle brother pointed a finger to loosen the strap of his helmet. What was hold back? Lowe gave us a good luck charm. Baby spice. I tipped the flask in his direction. Unlike Louisa, who was a bit eager but overall agreeable, her brother, for the lack of better description, were complete and utter twats. Supersized bullies who liked to pinch, pinch the maid on the arse, arse and make an unnecessary mess just to watch other tidy after them. Bloody hell, Byron snorted. She's pathetic. You mean considerate? Spending time with my father requires some level of intoxication. I drawled, I drawled sarcastically. It's not about that. She's obsessed with your sorry arse. Benedict supplied. Don't be ridiculous, I growled. Don't be blind. Byron barked at me. Ah, she'll get over it. They all do. I took another swig, grateful that my father and Byron Sr. were so engrossed in discussing parliament-related matters, they did not see fit to turn their heads and check on us. I hope she doesn't, Benedict sneered. If she is destined to marry your shit of brain, she should at very least enjoy it. Did you say marry? I lowered the flask. He might as well have said bury. No offense to your sister, but if she is waiting a proposal, she better get comfortable because one is not coming. Byron and Benedict exchanged looks, grinning conspiration, conspiratorially. They had the same color of lo same coloring as Louisa, fair as a French fallen snow. Only they looked like I drew them with my left hand. Don't tell me you don't know. Byron cocked his head, a cruel smile spreading across his face. I never was fond of him, but I especially wasn't fond of him at this moment. Know what? I gritted out, loathing that I had to play along to find out what they were talking about. You and Lo are going to tie a knot. It's all settled. There's even a ring. I laughed metallically, kicking Duchess' right side to make her bump into Benedict's mar, throwing him off balance. What a load of rubbish. As I continued laughing, I noticed their smiles had vanished. They were no longer looking at me with playful mischief. You taking the piss? My smile dropped. My throat felt like it was full of sand. No, Byron said flat out. Ask your father, Benedict challenged. It's been decided in our family for years. You're the eldest son of the Marquis of Fitzgrovia. Louisa is the daughter of the Duke of Salisbury, a lady. You will one day become the Marie Q, Marie Quest, yourself and our parents want the royal blood to stay within the family. Keep the estate intact. Marrying a commoner would weaken the chain. The Whitehall were one of the last families in the peerage. People still gave half a fuck about. My great-great-great-grandmother, Wilhelmina Whitehall, was the daughter of the king. I don't want to marry anyone, I said through gritted teeth. Duchess began picking up speed, entering the woods. Well, obviously, Benedict made the unflattering the face, you're 14 and all you want is to play with your games and fodle your meat to Christy Brinky posters. Nonetheless, you're marrying our sister too. Much business between our father to let this opportunity go to waste. And don't forget the estate they'll both get to keep. Byron added helpfully, giving his ma a vicious kick to make her go faster. I'll say good luck giving her children. She looks like Ridley Scott's alien. Children? The only thing preventing me from vom vomiting up my guts was the fact I did not want to waste the perfectly good brandy currently sloshing in my stomach. Lo says she wants five when she grows up. Byron cackled, enjoying himself. I reckon she's going to keep you busy in the sack. 
checkmate not to mention exhausted benedict lear over my dead body my throat grew tight my hands clammy i felt like i was the butt of the terrible joke of course i couldn't talk to my father about it i couldn't stand up to him not when i knew i was always the one i was always one word wrong from dumb waiter all i could do was shoot helpless animal and be exactly who he wanted me to be his little well oiled machine ready to kill fuck or marry as commanded later that night byron benedict and i sat in front of one of the dead foxes in the barn the pavilion scent of death swarmed around the room my father and byron senior had taken all their prized dead foxes to the tadder mixed and left one for us to dispose burn it play with it leave it with the rats to eat for all i care my father had spat before turning his back on the corpse it was a female small malnourished and dull fur she had cubs i could tell by the teeth poking through her belly fur i thought about them how they were all alone hungry and stranded in the dark vast woods i thought about how i shot her when papa ordered me to how i nailed a bullet straight between her eye how she stared at me with a mixture of amazement and terror and how i looked away because it had been papa i wanted to shoot benedict byron and i were passing a bottle of shamper back and forth discussing the evening events with Frank and Fox staring at me accusingly from across the barn. Benedict also obtained rolled up cigarettes from one of the servants. We puffed on them heartily. Come on, mate. Marrying our sister is in the end of the world. Byron offered a bond willing laugh as he stood over the fox. She's a child, I spat. I felt like my bones were... Uh, uh, She's a child, I spat. She's not going to be a child forever. Benedict poked the edge of his boot into the fox gut. To me, she will be. She'll make you even richer, Byron added. No money can buy my freedom. None of us were born free. Benedict thundered, stomping. What's the incentive to stay alive if not to gain more power? I don't know what the meaning of life is, but I'm sure it's fuck not going to take... pointers from a pudgy rich kid who needs to pay the mate to cop cop a feel i growled flashing my teeth i'll choose my own bride and it won't be your sister frankly it did not i did not want to marry at all for one thing i was certain i would be a terrible husband lazy unfaithful and in all probability obtuse but i wanted to keep my options open what if i did run into christy bringley I would marry the shit out of her if it meant getting into her knickers. Byron and Benedict exchanged puzzled looks. I knew they had no loyalty to their younger sister. She was after all a girl, and girls were not as distinguished, not as important as boys in period society. They couldn't continue the family's name and therefore were not treated as and therefore were treated as no more than a decoration you had to remember to include in christmas photo card it was the same with the young with my younger sister cecilia my father largely ignored her existence i always doted on her after he sent her to her room or tucked her away for being too round or too dull to parade around high society i would snuck cookies to her told her bedtime stories and took her to the woods where we played Get off your bloody white horse, Whitehall! You're too good. You're not too good for our sister. Byron moaned. That may well be, but I'm not sleeping with her. I'm not going to sleep with her. Why? Byron demanded. What's wrong with her? Nothing. Everything. I poked hay around the tip of my boot. I was fairly drunk by now. Would you rather kiss the fox mouth or loose? Benedict pressed his eyes wandering around the barn behind my shoulder and beyond I would rather kiss neither you class a minger well you must choose one must i i hiccuped picking up a stray horseshoe and throwing it at him i missed it by a mile what the bloody hell is that 
because byron uttered slowly if you kiss the fox i'll tell my dad you are gay that would fix everything up you would be off the hook gay i repeated mumbly i could be gay not technically no i loved women too much in every shape form color and hairstyle byron laughed you sure is pretty enough that's a stereotype i said and i immediately regretted it i was in no state to explain the word stereotype to these two morons bleeding heart liberal byron cackled elbowing his brother maybe he is gay benedict mused nah byron shook his head he already shagged a couple of birds i know well are you going to do it or not benedict demanded i considered the proposal Benedict and Byron were known for this kind of outrageous ploy. They spun lies around people and others just bought it. I knew because I went to the same school with them. What one what was one silly kiss on the dead fox's mouth is in a grand scam of things. There is only one hope. If I butted heads with my father, one of us would die. As it stood right now, that someone was going to be me. Fine. I pushed myself up from the stool, zigzagging my way to Frank and Fox. I bent down and pressed my lips to the fox's mouth. It was gummy and cold and smelled like used dental floss. Bile coated my throat. Mate, oh god, is he actually doing this? Benedict snorted behind my back. Why don't I have a camera? Byron moaned. He was on the floor clutching his stomach. He was laughing so hard. I pulled back my ears were ringing my vision turned milky I saw everything through a yellow haze someone behind me screamed I swiveled back quickly falling to my knees low was there at the open double door of the barn still in her pink pajamas her hand pressed to her mouth as she trembled like a leaf you 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 perv she mewed low i'm sorry i grunted and i was but not for not wanting to marry her only for how she found out about it benedict and byron were rolling on the hay punching each other laughing and laughing and laughing they had set me up they knew she was there by the door watching all along i was never going to get out of this arrangement low world around and bolted her tears like tiny diamonds flew behind her shoulder the scream that tore from her mouth was feral like the one Franklin Fox had made before I killed her. I kneeled over and threw up, collapsing into the remain of my dinner. Darkness spun around me, and I, in return, succumbed to it. My father handed me a whiskey the morning after. We were in his big oak study with a golden bar shawly and burgundy drapes. One of the servants had hauled me into his office minutes earlier. No explanation was needed. He had simply dragged me across the carpets and disposed of me at Papa's feet. Here for your hangover. Papa motioned for the tan leather recliner in front of his desk. I sat accepting the drink. You're giving me whiskey? I sniffed it, my lips curling in disgust. Hair of a dog. He sprawled in his executive chair, smoothing his mustache with his fingers. taking the hair of dog that bit you eases up the withdrawal i took a swig of the poison wincing as it scorched its way to my gut i've had a sleepless night night on the hay in the barn i kept waking up in the cold sweat dreaming of the tiny louisa like babies running after me the taste of dead fox's kiss mm -hmm. didn't exactly soften the blow either The scent of black tea and fresh scones wafted through the half of Whitehall Court Castle. Breakfast wasn't quite over. My stomach roiled, reminding me that appetite was a luxury for men who weren't newly and unwittingly betrothed. I drained my whiskey. You wanted to see me? I never want to see you. Unfortunately, it's a necessity that comes with siring you. My fa my papa did not mince words. Something quite disturbing was brought to my attention this morning. Lady Louisa told her parents what happened yesterday and her father relayed to me the situation. My father, tall 
lean and striking with sandy blonde hair and a neatly pressed suit drawled with accusation in his voice inviting me to explain myself we both knew he disliked me on a personal level that he would sire new successors if it wasn't for the fact that i remained the eldest and therefore the heir to his title i was too graceful too much of a bookworm too much like my mum i allowed other boys to dominate me to make me defile an animal I don't want to marry her. I expected a slap or a thrashing. Neither would come as a surprise, but what I got was a light chuckle and a shake of his head. I understand, he said. Do I not have to? I perked up. Oh, you will marry that girl. Your wishes have no significance. Neither do your thought for that matter. Marriage of love are for the great unwashed masses. people born to follow society's thankless rules you shall not desire your wife devin her purpose is to serve you sire children and look lovely word to the wise keep your desire for those of whom you can dispose it's smarter and cleaner commoners rule do not apply to the upper class the need to violently smash his head against the wall was so urgent my fingers twitched in my lap When I remained silent for several minutes, he rolled his eyes, looking skyward, like I was the one being unreasonable. You think I wanted to marry your mother? What's wrong with my mom? She was pretty and reasonably nice. What's not? What's not? He took a cigar out of a box and lit it up. If she ran as much as her mouth, she would be in good shape. She was a package deal, though. She had the money. I had the title. We made it work. I stared into the bottle bottom of my empty whiskey glass that sounded like a tagline for most depressing romantic comedy in the world we don't need more money and I'll, i already have the title it's not just the money you idiot he slammed his palm against his desk standing between us roaring all that stands between us and the commoner that serve us is the pedigree and the power power corrupts i said curtly This world is corrupt. His lips curled in disgust. I knew bloody well I was close to being thrown in the dumb waiter. I'm trying to explain to you in simple English that the matter of your nuptial to Miss Bichard is not up for debate. At any rate, it is hardly going to happen tomorrow. No, not tomorrow and not at all. I heard myself say, I won't marry her. Mum would stand for it. Your mother has no say in these things. His azure eye darkened into a marbled mirror. I could see myself in their reflection. I looked small and sunken, not myself, not the boy, not the boy who rode horses with the wind dancing in his face, who pushed his hand under the servant's girl's dress and made her giggle breathlessly. Breathe, breathlessly. The boy who The boy with the explosive speed and dazzling footwork who made some of the Europe's best fence a week. That boy could pierce his father's black heart with a pointy sword and eat his heart while it was still beating. This boy could not. You'll marry her and you'll give me a perfect male ch- grandchild, preferably. One superior to yourselves. My father finished his cigar. stubbing it in the nearby ashtray this matter is settled now go apologize to louisa you will marry her after you after you finish oxford university and not an amount not a moment later and you will lose or you will lose your entire inheritance your family name the relatives who for the reason unknown to me still tolerate you because make no mistake devon when i tell you your mother She is to disown you. She won't think twice before turning her back on her child. Am I understood? My cunningness overtook me just then, as I had the tendency to do it, washing over my skin like acid, making me turn inside out and become someone else. There was no point fighting him. I had no leverage. I could get thrashed, locked, mocked, and tortured, or I could play by the cards right. Do what he and Mr. Butcher did so often. Play the system. Yes, sir. My father narrowed his eyes suspiciously. 
I am telling you to marry Louisa. Yes, sir. And apologize to her now. Certainly, sir. I bowed my head deeper, a ghost of smile hovering my lips, and kiss her. Show her you like her. No tongue or funny business. Just enough to prove you are true to your word. Bile scrooch its way up my throat. I'll kiss her. Astonish, astonish, astonishingly, he looked even less pleased. What made you change your mind? My father was both mean and an idiot. A horrid combination. He had more temper than brain, which led him to make many business mistakes. At home, he reigned with an iron face that more often than not landed on my face. The business mistakes were easier to deal with. My mother had taken over the books without his knowledge and he was nearly always too drunk to realize. As for my abuse, she knew bloody well that if she tried to protect me, he would belt her too. Suppose you're right. I leaned back in my seat, crossing my legs casually. What difference does this make? who I marry, as long as I can sleep my way into the record book of history. He chuckled, the darkness in his eyes, marrying a heat and sinner of a son, with a deficit of sculpts scrupulous and even fewer positive traits. Shagged another yet? Yes, sir, at thirteen. He brushed his thumb under his chin. I first slept with a woman at twelve. Brilliant, I said. Though the idea of my father pounding into a woman from behind at twelve made me want to curl, to want to curl to a se- made me want to curl onto a therapist sofa and not leave for a decade. Well then, he slapped his thigh. Onward and upward, young lad. English aristocracy done does not come cheap. You must preserve it in order to maintain it. Then I shall do my part, Papa. I stood up, shooting a him a sla- shooting him a sly smirk. That was the day I trusted. Then I shall do my part, Papa. I stood up, shooting him a sly smirk. That was the day I truly became became a rake. The day I turned into the crafty, soulless soul I now saw when I looked into the mirror. The day I intend. The day I indeed apologized to Louisa, even kissed her on the cheek and told her not to worry, that I had been drunk and it was a mistake, that we would be the most definite that that we would most definitely get married and that it would be a beautiful event with flowers, girls, archbishops, and a cake taller than the skyscraper. I played my cards right for the next decade, sent her birthday present. Showered her with cards and met her often during summer breaks. I dug flour in her hair and told her all other girls I had shagged were meaningless. I let her wait and pine and crock it a future for both of us in her head. I even convinced my father to fund my Harvard law degree across the pond and postpone the marriage for a couple of years, explaining that I would soon become that I would. Be back as soon as I graduated to take Louisa as my wife. But the truth was, the day I completed secondary education and was shipped to Boston, for the last time I set foot on British soil. The last time my father saw me, it was the perfect betrayal. Really, I used his well, his wealth and connection until I didn't need any more. An advanced law degree from an Ivy League school was sufficient. Capital to bag a four hundred k a year partnership at one of the biggest law firms in Boston. By third year, I tripled the amount, including bonuses, and now, now I was a self-made millionaire. My life was mine to lead, to rule, and to cock up. And I only dumb waiter, and the only dumb waiter I was stuck in was deep inside my head. The voices from my past still echoed inside it. Reminding me that love was nothing but a mid-school, mid-class affliction. Now this was the prologue. It was pretty big, I know, but I still want to read the chapter one because uh, you know uh, it's like you saw the Devon's point of view. I want to give you the Bell's point of view, but this video is already too long, so I'll stop this here. I read the Bell's point of view and. Uh, 
the epilogue in the next video so thank you so much for watching this one and if you like or want the whole book just let me know in the comment section or in the email id or in the dm me uh thank you so much bye bye